in my talk today, I want to talk a little bit about some environmental, environmental stuff we need to be aware of, give a few updates on some of the newer herbicide projects, and talk about some of my, some of my studies I've done this past summer. Now, the first, I want to talk about some label and product updates that we need to be aware of. Um, the first, and it's going to be more and more pronounced in the news, is the Endangered Species Act and Endangered Species Mitigation Practices. Um, previously, the EPA didn't exactly follow everything they needed to do when registering new pesticides as far as it pertain, pertains to, you know, the Endangered Species Act. This resulted in insufficient protections for a lot of new endangered species, as well as some resource intensive litigation against EPA when they tried to register these pesticides. If you have any questions about that, you can talk to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> So last January, the EPA announced that it would follow some new guidelines for re-registering and registering active ingredients. Um, this basically means that EPA has to initiate a formal consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Natural Marine Fisheries Service before granting a new pesticide registration if this pesticide is likely to adversely affect an endangered species or its habitat. If the EPA determines that jeopardy or adverse modification is likely, the agents see will only make a registration decision if the company or the registrants agree to implement some sort of EP mitigation measures that the EPA determines would be necessary to prevent you know, that adverse modification. If that new AI is likely to adversely affect the listed species or their critical habitat, but that jeopardy or adverse modification is not likely, the EPA can still say that the registrant needs to implement these mitigation measures. And a lot of these mitigation measures have already been implemented into some products. Two types of mitigation me measures I'm going to mention. Um, the first is going to be endangered species bulletins. Now, on some labels that you read, and I hope, hope you're reading all of your labels, around the first one or two pages, you'll see a paragraph that in here that basically states that you must obtain a bulletin no earlier than six months before using a certain product. This bulletin, does, unfortunately, is not included in, in the label. So you must go to this bulletin two's, Bulletin's Live 2 website in order to obtain that Endangered Species Bulletin. What you do is you'll enter the location of your farm. In this case, we're looking at some farm in Annapolis, Maryland. When you plan to apply that herbicide, the EPA registration number, and it will automatically populate the list for you. And you will see a, and you will get a PDF. That fi PDF file is going to have a map. In some cases, you'll see nothing else on that map. If you are spraying a pesticide that has some, any type of uh, restrictions for endangered species, you will see this on that map. And all these browned out areas, these are places where you will not be able to spray that particular pesticide. If your farm is located in one of these areas, you cannot spray that pesticide. Fortunately, in Maryland right now, we do not have any pesticides that I know of that have any restrictions as far as those endangered species protection bulletins. How about Delaware? Delaware, I am not aware of. Other thing about endangered species mitigation is going to be mitigating rainfall and runoff. One practice is going to be, you know, application must take place no less than 48 hours prior to irrigation or predictive rainfall. Now, does it say anything about how much rainfall or whose prediction we're, we're relying on? No, it does not. That's, there's still some gaps in the knowledge there. But there's also going to be these pick lists, which are basically you know, ways to curve mitigation or runoff from your farm. A lot of it we're already t already do uh, no-till cover crops. Unlike carbon credits, where 
if you've done it for several years, you're not going to get any get the credits for that. But with these endangered species pick list, you do you do you will get credits, and you need these credits for certain herbicides. For example, all of this is based on your soil type, your lighter soils, group A, and your heavy, A and B, and your heavier soils, group C, C and D. Your lighter soils, you, for this particular herbicide, you need uh, four credits. So if you're spraying this, um, if you only make one application, that's four credits. If you're making two applications, then you're going to have to get some other credits, usually by, possibly by no-till, having a cover crop, so on and so forth. If you're in the heavier soil types, group D, you need six credits. So in addition to making one application, you'll need to have something else, either no-till or a cover crop. Now, I did mention this, that some of these measures are already in place, and this is actually taken off the Enlist label. So if you are spraying Enlist Duo, Enlist One, which I know a lot of you are because I'm sure a lot of you have been planting Enlist Beans, these practices already need to be in place. So if David comes to inspect your farm and he sees that you're, you sprayed Enlist, Enlist Duo, four or five times and your um, con conventional till, you're probably going to get written up. But a lot of these things are still in the works, and the Enlist label is the only one I think I, right now that has these mitigation measures. Uh, the Atrazine label will probably have these mitigation measures. If you have any questions, uh, you can Google ESA work plan or uh, look at that QR code. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the new herbicide products out there. there are, I will say that there are no new herbicide active ingredients, just mixtures of uh, old products. Um, good rule of thumb, you know, is if any of these products look interesting to you, you might want to try them out on a smaller area on your farm until they prove themselves. You don't really have to change your entire herbicide program just because I mentioned something new and fancy. And, you know, it always never hurts to have a good rainfall. So the first new herbicide I want to talk about is going to be Resicor XL. Um, this is going to be replacing regular Resicor in some areas. Um, both Resicor and Resicor XL are mixtures of Acetochlor, Warrant, uh, Mesotrium, Callisto, and Clopyrrolid Stinger, um, both labeled for preplant, pre, and post-emergence. The real difference is in this Resicor XL is going to have a lower concentration of that Mesotrione, of that Callisto component. And with the Resicor XL, you do have a wider window when you're doing your post applications. So instead of spraying Resicor up to 11 inch corn, you can spray Resicor uh, XL up to 24 inch corn. Um, the Resicor XL does have some greater tank mix compatibility if you want to put it on with some of your micronutrients, UAN, uh, ATS. I did look at this herbicide in trials in 2021 and 22, and it saw that the Resicor XL did provide some great late season broadleaf weed control, including morning glories, as well as grass says, and it, uh, when, applied it and when, when applied with atrazine, it, we, it was comparable with, you know, some of our other products on the market, your Acuron products, Bicep, Halex, GT, uh, Princep, and Triple Flex, things like that. Uh, next new herbicide for corn is going to be uh, Maverick from Balant. Has similar herbicide groups that the Resicor does. It also has a clopyrrolid component, a mesotrione component, and a different group 15 component, that pyroxysulfone, also known as Zidua. Um, good broadleaf control, chickweeds, common ragweed, morning glories, and palmer. Good grass control spectrum too, from your crab grasses to your fall panicums and your foxtails. Um, if you're spraying this on fine soils, you can do a split application, about 14 to 18 fluid ounces pre and 14 fluid ounces early post-emergence. Um, those post-emergence applications, regardless, will need to be made uh, before 18-inch corn or V6, whichever stage comes first. Uh, Another new herbicide for corn is going to be Trivolt. Many of you are probably already familiar or use uh, Corvus, 
which is a mixture of isoxaflutol and uh, the group 2 in herbicide, thiancarbazone. Trivolt just adds another herbicide, flufenacet, to that mix. Um, reason, uh, Bayer's reasoning for adding that flufenacet to the Corvus mix is it's going to work under a variety of weather conditions. So after a dry period, you've got that isoxaflutol component that's going to activate with, a little, with about a half inch of rain. But if it's wet, you have that flufenacet component that's going to maintain um, good grass activity. A couple more. Um, the impact label, the tepramazone, now allows you to apply that up, up to two ounces per acre on corn now. The Zidua SC, I mentioned peroxisulfone earlier, that, that same product. Um, label allows for use up into 8-inch corn. I uh, will mention that pyroxysulfone is a soil active herbicide. It will not control emerged weeds, but this is a good option um, for an overlapping residual program. The Python label, if you have prickly cyta on your farm, there is now a new 2EE label uh, for controlling prick prickly cyta. Uh, anywhere from 2 inches to 4 inches, about 0.23 ounces for 2 inch prickly cyta, up to 0.69 ounces for 6 inch prick prickly cyta, and that's python. Uh, one soybean herbicide I want to mention is uh, Tendovo, uh, a new product from, newer product from Syngenta. It's a mixture of Espitolachlor, dual, uh, metribuzin, and chlorancelam, or first rate. A lot of us are probably f very familiar with first rate. Um, good control of a lot of our larger seeded broadleaf weeds, uh, like uh, a common ragweed. Um, first rate, you can apply, you know, basically pre plant, pre and post. With Tendovo, you can only apply. Uh, this product pre, but again, it does have really good spectrum, uh, spectrum of broadleaf weed control and grass control. Um, looked at this last year. Uh, studies provided overall good to excellent weed control, and it was comparable to uh, Fierce MTZ, which has, uh, again, similar active ingredients. However, just last year, we did see that that Fierce MTZ yields were, were higher, but that was just one study. Um, now I want to talk about some weeds of concern and what I've done to look at, at controlling them this past year. The first thing I want to talk about is common chickweed. It's, emer it's emerging, or it's already emerged right now, it's in our field. A lot of it's resistant to our group 2 herbicides, Osprey, Harmony, and you know, problem, another problem with chickweed is it usually competes its life cycle before we do our burn down in the spring. So it's already, if you have it and you're not controlling it, it's already dropped the seeds before you can even spray it to control it with your burn down. One of the things that we found out in recent years is that metribuzin is really good at controlling common chickweed. The state of Maryland does have a 24C label for the use of Metricor DF and win winter wheat and barley. Recommend about two to four ounces per acre. Um, wide range uh, for spraying anywhere from two leaf to full tiller, but it's still best to apply this when those chickweeds are small, about uh, four to six inches in diameter. Another good thing about Metribuzin is you can spray it in soybeans, so there's no ro rotational restrictions for your double, double crop beans. Just looking at some of the control results from a couple of the, our studies, um, everything on the y-axis is just, just going to be general overall percent control. For this particular study, we looked at uh, Metricor 4F and DF the liquid formulation and the dry formulation, and we compared that to a pendomethylene product satellite hydrocapped and audit 1.1, which is similar to Harmony. And in that, this particular study, we're looking at chickweed control 30 days after treatment, in the, after a spring treatment, and both of our metribuzin treatments alone are giving us, you know, about 98 to 100% control. Last year, I looked at a study incorporating metribuzin with a bunch of the haloxifen type products. Haloxifen is a new group 4 herbicide registered for wheat. Uh, you can find it in Quellex, uh, Pixaro, 
and Tarzek. What we did in this study was we just looked the combinations of fat, those haloxifen herbicides with Harmony Extra, uh, Powerflex, or Metribuzin, with either Quelex, Pixaro, or Tarzek. And what we saw was our best treatment, our best tank mix treatment for controlling chickweed occurred when we mixed one of these haloxifen products, the group fours, with Metribuzin. Here's Quelex with Metribuzin, Pixara with Metribuzin, and Tarzek with Metribuzin. Not only did we get better control with those products, we got faster chickweed control when we added that Metribuzin to the tank mix. Next weed I want to talk about is going to be Italian ryegrass, and this might scare some of you. Now, so we already have confirmed resistance to groups one and group two herbicides, and we have ryegrass, and fortunately one of those species that has multiple emergence periods. In 2021 and 22, I conducted a study to confirm the possibility that there might be some glyphosate resistant Italian ryegrass. So in this study, what I did was I looked at different application timings, a fall application timings to maybe get that first flush, a spring application timing uh, to get it you know, as a burn down, or do we need to do a fall and spring application timing to completely control our emergent ryegrass populations? I looked at combinations of just Roundup alone, Roundup plus Select Max, uh, Roundup plus Sharpen, Sharpen is generally a very good broadleaf herbicide, and there's been some studies showing that, you know, mixing it with Roundup does help with Italian ryegrass control. Also looked at Roundup plus Valor. Valor does control, can control Italian ryegrass pre-emergence. You can apply it early pre-plant to a wheat and, of course, uh, pre-plant in soybeans. From this study, um, we saw that there was an effect of either our application timing or our herbicide. First, we, look at our when we looked at our application timings, either a fall application, spring application, or a sequential application. We saw that we really needed to spray Italian ryegrass twice to get the best control, but the best control was only about 80%. For our herbicide treatments, our Roundup, our Roundup plus Select Max, our Roundup plus Sharpen, our Roundup plus Valor. Our best treatment was when we tank mixed Roundup plus Select Max, only about, but still only getting about 85% control. Roundup alone, uh, Roundup plus Sharpen and Roundup plus Valor, significantly lower control. And we see we only got, you know, about 38, 39% control with just Roundup alone. Looks like we're dealing with some, some resistance here. So we did a greenhouse study uh, looking at uh, two different, two different po susceptible or resistant populations, one from 2020 and one I collected from that field last year in 2022 and compared that to a susceptible population. We looked at our field rate of 36 ounces per acre and we doubled that to 72 ounces per acre. Our 2020 population at our standard field rate of 36 ounces per acre only controlled that Italian ryegrass about 15%. Only controlled about 10% more when we doubled the rate. Our 2022 population, a little over 50%, and at the 1x, the 36, 36 ounce rate and about 85 percent at 72 ounce rate and of course our susceptible population we're getting 90 to 100 percent control. When I looked did the math to kind of calculate a possible LD50 for these populations the LD50 is the lethal dose necessary to kill half only half of the population. For that 2020 population the LD50 was 260 ounces of Roundup per acre. That's a very high rate to use and a very expensive rate to use. So you're probably not going to control this with Roundup. And, and that, that is very un unfortunate because this was all done as a burn down study. And what are you using in your burn down? 
usually glyphosate and 2,4-D. 2,4-D is not going to control Italian ryegrass. Now glyphosate doesn't control Italian ryegrass. So that's definitely some more areas where I'm looking to do some research. All right. Next thing I'm sure you're all familiar with is going to be mare's tail. We have resistance to glyphosate and group 2 herbicides. And it too has multiple emergence periods in the fall and spring, primarily a concern at planting. But if you're like me, this year you might have noticed you did, did your burn down and then sometime in late May you had some more horseweed emerge. So did a study, just a general burn down study, not look, looking not only con to control horseweed, but I also remember that and we had the issue with glyphosate last year where it was a little expensive. So I did a study for the soybean board looking at uh, different bur burn, uh, your basic burn down herbicides and you know which might work best. So first we looked at um, split applications of either select max aggress herbicide or either enlist one, uh, 2,4-D and extend to max ticamba. Uh, uh, one of our broadleaf herbicides. We did split applications with the, with the, the grass and broadleaf herbicide because we have seen some t antagonism when we tank mix the two. A lot of times when you tank mix uh, like 2,4-D with select or something like that, you will see a reduction in grass control. We also looked at, you know, single uh, tank mix combinations of things like Sharpen and Select Max, or you know, Roundup 2,4-D, Roundup and Dicamba, but also wanted to see if we get any benefit from mixing Roundup plus, plus Liberty or Roundup plus Germoxone. So just looking at our split applications 10 days after our applications, uh, after we applied it for grass control, we did this at two sites, Central Maryland and at the Y. I can't say that I was really thrilled about the grass control we got from those split applications. For one thing, at, the, at Central Maryland, the highest control we got was when we did select followed by enlist, and that was only about 21%. Now at the Y, we got better control. Everything that was sprayed with select first, regardless of what it was followed by enlist, extend, or sharpen, we really didn't see that much of a significant difference in control. However, when select was applied last, we did see uh, a little bit drop in control there. Thing about select, select takes a longer time to work, usually about two weeks to see any real differences. So maybe if, we would have, if I would have rated this a couple days later, we might, might have seen better control, especially with these. But the point is, it does take select a while to work, and you're not going to see you know, results as fast as you would with some of these other herbicides. As far as broadleaf control, a little bit better broadleaf control when we did these split applications. Um, for uh, Simrec, our select followed by sharpen treatment did the best, but as far as the studies we did, I did with the Y, um, select followed by extend, sharpen, or if we followed select after enlist or 2,4-D or extend or sharpen, still got, still got about 85 to 90 percent control of, of our broadleaf weeds. For our tank mix uh, treatments we did, just looking at uh, grass control with a single application, very good grass control with all of our herbicide treatments. Uh, whether uh, alone, a single application of Roundup, Liberty, or Gramoxone, or you no know, mixed together. So we really didn't see any benefit of grass control if we added uh, Roundup to that Liberty mix or Gramoxone to the Liberty mix. Grass control was the same, just with a single herbicide. Broadleaf weed control little bit different. For Simrec, um, saw a decline in broadleaf weed control with the sharpen followed by select. Everything else, about 80, 80 to 90 percent broadleaf control except at the Y. See our control with Roundup here. Most of our broadleafs in that study were mare's tail. They're glyphosate resistant. 
adding extend uh, liberty or uh, 2,4-D did help to increase the control of um, that resistant horseweed population. But again, look at the combinations of Roundup with Liberty, Roundup plus Germoxone, not really seeing any differences in control or any contribution of that Roundup at mix adding to anything to uh, Liberty or Germoxone. So as far as an alternative burn down to Roundup, Roundup both Liberty and Germoxone worked very well. And so this is a Germoxone treatment about 10 days later compared to, you can see a little bit of green from the other plots. This was by far the best looking plot I saw. Now while the other herbicides maybe took about a week to burn down, the Germoxone treatment worked in about three days. Another thing I wanted, wanted to point out from this study is here we see our Roundup Plus Enlist treatments and our Roundup Plus Extend treatments. I've seen this over the past couple of years where if we're looking at, you know, managing horseweed for our burn down, we're seeing a little bit better control consistently with Roundup Plus Dicamba compared to Roundup Plus 2,4-D. This is another burn down study I did last year that actually compared burn down treatments with Dicamba Plus Glyphosate or 2,4-D plus glyphosate at three different rating dates, 14 days after application, 28 days, and 56 days, we saw that at each rating date, our dicamba plus glyphosate treatment had, had consistently better mare's tail control than our 2,4-D plus glyphosate treatment. So, you know, dicamba, good option if horseweed is your only concern. Um, if you're going to plant, if you wanted to plant extend flex beans so you can plant a little earlier to control that horseweed, be my guest. Just be aware that with the dicamba, you still have that uh, July, June 30th cutoff registration. And you really, it's really not the best option for applying it in crop. All right, next, Palmer Amaranth. For, I know I've talked about Palmer Amaranth in a lot of these talks. If you haven't already seen it, I do have a nice cardboard cutout back there. Feel free to take your picture with it so you know what Palmer Amaranth looks like and so you know how big you do not want Palmer Amaranth to get in your field because it is still a problem in Maryland. Um, this year we saw a lot of late or ine ineffective applications made. Um, control of this Palmer amaranth is on the noxious weed list. So control, if you have it, control of this weed must be a priority. But I know that can be difficult given everything else you have to control in your field. So knowing when and what herbicides to apply is very important. So. Knowing that we have to control all these weeds that emerge in the fall and emerge in the spring, like Palmer Amaranth, did a study a couple of years seeing about what kind of herbicide program might we be able to implement. So we did kind of a fact factorial study where we looked at both fall treatments and spring treatments, where our fall, fall treatments included a no fall treatment or a fall treatment with no residual, which was just a glyphosate 2,4-D burn down, or fall treatments with a burn down and a residual herbicide, either Canopy, EX, or Valor. Then we followed that by a spring treatment with either no spring treatment and early spring treatment where we applied uh, glyphosate and 2,4-D and Canopy about four weeks before planting, a late spring treatment where those same herbicides, glyphosate, 2,4-D, and Canopy were applied about one to two weeks before planting, or a sequential spring treatment where we did a burn down of glyphosate and 2,4-D about four weeks prior to planting, then followed that with paraquat, glomoxone at planting, and canopy. So, looking at two different weeds I just mentioned, a mare's tail and palmer amaranth, looking at mare's tail first, there was a nice interaction of our both, both our fall and spring treatments. If we did not apply any type of spring treatment, this red bar to the left, we saw much better Ameristel control when we included that residual herbicide. 
But if we included at least a spring treatment with our no-fall treatment, got about 100% control with um, our late spring application or our early spring application. If we did the fall with, resi the fall with residual, that's just a regular burn down, or the spring treatments, really no difference. Those spring treatments really helped improve that meristel control, whether it was applied early in the spring, late in the spring, or we did sequential applications. Palmer amaranth was another story. Fall herbicides do not control Palmer amaranth. You cannot put anything out two months ago before Christmas that's going to have a residual that's going to last long enough to control Palmer amaranth. So what we saw is with our spring treatments, we see this nice stepwise pattern where we saw better control as we applied closer to planting with our early spring treatment, our late spring treatment, and our sequential spring treatment, which gave us the best control. Now this um, rating was taken four weeks after planting, and I've said it before. Residual herbicides usually will only last you about four weeks. If you're planting, if you're putting on your residual herbicide with your burn down for four weeks before planting, that residual is not going to last you four weeks after planting, and you're going to have to apply your post-emergent herbicide a lot sooner. But if you wait and apply that residual herbicide at planting, you're going to get much better control. Now, herbicides not not just the only things that we can use to manage our weeds, and I do want to end kind of with a cover crop study we did looking at uh, cereal rye management for some of these summer annual weeds. In this study, we looked at either no cover crop and we looked at what happens. We get better cover crop, better weed suppression if we do no nitrogen on the rye or about 18 pounds of nitrogen on the rye. We also looked at a cereal rye termination dates. It's better to terminate 10 days before planting or 20 days before planting. And should, would we need any type of residual herbicide to help improve control? Now, looking at horseweed and Palmer amaranth, the results were a little bit different for each species. The horseweed on the red bar and Palmer amaranth, the yellow bar, we did here 20 days after planting, burn down the cover crop, or 10 days after planting. If we burnt down 20 days before planting, we got better control of our horseweed, our mare's tail, compared to 10 days before planting. Think about when you're applying it. 20 days before planting, that's just when that mare's tail is starting to emerge, and you're, probably, and you're going to get it when it's smaller. However, Palmer amaranth, suppression 20 days before planting was a lot was lower than Palmer amaranth suppression 10 days for, before planting when you're using a cover crop like cereal rye to manage Palmer amaranth you need biomass you need uh, lignified tissue you need carbon tissue on the ground to help suppress that Palmer amaranth the later you wait to terminate it the more of that tissue you're going to get and the better weed suppression you're going to get Looking at the effect of uh, cover crop and nitrogen on Palmer amaranth control, or residual applica herbicide application and nitrogen. As long as we had a residual herbicide, regardless of whether we had a cover crop with or without nitrogen or no cover crop at all, we got about 90 to 100% control. However, if we did not apply any type of residual herbicide, all of our cover crop treatments, our treatment with nitrogen without, or without nitrogen, were significantly better than having that no cover crop treatment. I like the cereal rye cover crop um, with residual herbicide just because it provides some type of, insur of insurance, some redundancy. Say your herbicide, your residual herbicide doesn't get activated because of lack of rainfall. You still have that cover crop on the ground to help suppress those weeds. And what that cover crop is doing, it is suppressing those weeds. It's not controlling these weeds. But with the cover crop, you see different, in this picture you see different levels of cover crop biomass. Where we see the highest cover crop biomass is 
you see fewer weeds, and you don't see those weeds large. You don't see them canoping over each other. And that's what we want when we have weeds and we need to incorporate our post-emergence herbicide sprays. Because your post-emergence herbicides, like Liberty, those are contact herbicides. Spray coverage is critical for controlling these. So you want to have smaller weeds with less canopy so all that herbicide reaches the target and effectively kills uh, um, what you're wanting to get rid of. So some takeaways. Just um, remember, be aware, you know, good burn down herbicides, your glyphosate, 2,4-D, uh, glufosinate, paraquat, and your post-emergence herbicides, they're not going to provide any type of residual control. So it's really important to include those residual herbicides or even a, have that cover crop on your soil uh, for a successful pre- and post-emergence program. But remember, I mentioned earlier, a lot of late misses with Palmer amaranth this year. Post options for Palmer amaranth are limited. If you have Palmer amaranth in your field, do not plant Roundup Ready beans. Roundup will not control it. You don't have anything to control it. Fortunately, we have Enlist beans and we have ExtendFlex varieties. With both Enlist and ExtendFlex, you can still apply Roundup if you want to. You can also apply Liberty over the top of these beans. Enlist, you can apply 2,4-D. Extend, you can apply Dicamba. Just be aware that you cannot apply Dicamba over Enlist beans or 2,4-D over Dicamba beans. They will die. And just be aware of these cutoff stages for these herbicides. For Liberty and Enlist, you cannot spray those past R1. So if, you're, if you've got Palmer in your field and you see a nice canopy and it's, you know, uh, August, late September, you prob you're not going to be able, one thing, you're not going to be able to control it with Liberty. You're just going to kind of nick the edges here and make it a little mad. But you're also making an illegal application and an ineffective application. June 30th, still the cutoff date for your Dicamba products, Ingenia, Extendamax, Tavium, um, not necessarily the best uh, option if you're doing double crop beans because you won't be able to use the Dicamba to control any Palmer amaranth after June 30th. And finally, um, some of you are already aware, um, the new uh, uh, crop management slash weed management guides are out. Um, there's the Penn State Agronomy Guide and the Virginia Tech Field Crops Guide. The weed control information in both of these guides is the same. Now, if you're someone who likes to download something onto your phone and read it on your computer, this is your best bet because this is, you can download this from the Virginia Tech, Tech website as a free PDF. If you're someone who likes to have a book that you can carry around with you in your truck, this is probably your best bet now. You have to pay, if you want to order hard copies of these, you do need to pay for them. But right now, the Penn State Agro Agronomy Guide is going to be 25% off through March 30th. Um, regular price for the book is about $35. So right now, it's uh, going to be about a few bucks cheaper to order this guide right now compared to this. Uh, there's also uh, a soybean budget tool developed by my colleague, Dr. Alan Leslie. I know I talked a lot about herbicides without giving you prices. Um, this has a lot, this includes a lot of the herbicides that you'll use for your soybean burn down as well as your post-emergence and, and your uh, uh, nutrient applications as well as well as the integrated weed management, the GROW website has a lot of good information, updated inf data inf information about other tactics that have been used around the country for weed management. And with that, if I have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them, but I know it's getting close to lunchtime too. Any questions? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, uh, Darren Alice, uh, Division Chief for the Animal Feeding Operations Division. The Maryland Department of the Environment. So just a couple quick uh, topics here I want to touch on. We, uh, the avian flu uh, situation continues. We've been doing our best to uh, conduct inspections as, as part of our mandate. Um, so we're working with farm operators to get those scheduled via uh, phone calls, um, texts, emails, et cetera, just to reach out. We're just trying to find out an understanding of getting in between flocks and following the state biosecurity protocols. So it's a tight window. 
understand that there's a lot going on for the operators to um, prepare for the next flock, um, but that's our open window there uh, to get in. So um, just be aware of that when we try to reach out to you. Um, we're just trying to make those arrangements and um, record basically that farm operators are um, following our compliance requirements and uh, we do have inspection numbers to report as well. So um, we've posted a couple different positions here uh, for the inspectors. Um, we, we have one that uh, has uh, accepted the first uh, position as an inspector uh, for our inspections unit. Uh, that person does have a strong agricultural farm background here on the eastern shore. Um, also uh, strong uh, animal feeding operation experience. So we're very encouraged to uh, have that person uh, uh, come on board with us and that person will start later this month. We do have another position that we're posting, a second inspector position, and the filing deadline uh, for that will be March uh, 16th. Uh, there's a few different state environmental initiatives. Um, really across the state for all state agencies to uh, look at, recognize um, the environmental justice, um, climate change, and Chesapeake Bay initiatives. So um, each state agency really has to uh, you know, address those uh, situations for us. There are some things we've already done you know, in working with animal feeding operations. Uh, we just need to report, categorize, et cetera, uh, to meet those initiatives. Um, also, um, the uh, annual reporting, um, again, Howard's going to touch more on that in his talk, but I do want to um, uh, let you all know that in 2021, every single uh, CAFO, MAFO operator that was uh, sent out uh, an annual implementation report from MDA returned it back uh, for filing. So that's kind of a first, that's really a positive uh, reflection of farmers um, uh, you know, meeting that requirement. We only had like 13 uh, that sent out um, return incomplete forms. So we work with those individuals to make sure those reports are complete. Annual permit fees for concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, there, those letters, those billing invoices go out every June. 30 days for the return of those um, billings based again on your size of your CAFO category. Uh, so we're working with that as well. Um, as far as coverage status, you know, we have uh, 262 animal feeding operations uh, that have been registered under this current permit um, and we're working with the balance um, which mostly consists of uh, land operations. So working through that. If you have any questions, I'll be here, um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Ben Bevan with Shorag Air Service. Good to see so many familiar faces here today. Um, we provide aerial seeding, fertilizing, and spraying to the Delmarva. We're based out of Sellersville, just south of Sellersville there. Um, a lot of from. I'd like to take this time to thank all of our customers. We appreciate your business, and we're looking forward to working with you this coming season. I'll be around the rest of the day if you have any questions. If you don't currently do business with us and you have interest, feel free to be glad to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.